welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar on three forms every company should be using and going beyond mobile data collection. I'll be your host today and my name is Barrett Johannesson. Our presenter today is Jonathan Sue, and from here we'll kind of go through some announcements that we have. So first and foremost we have a great new blog post uh, that is linked here so when John uploads the presentation and uploads the recording later on actually in the next 48 hours uh, you'll be able to go in and click on this link. I'll also put it in the chat section momentarily. But that's a very, very helpful blog post, so I definitely suggest checking it out. We also have three upcoming webinars that we wanted to note. Uh, the first one is October 25th, and it's just getting started with form building. This is a great session for anyone who's new to form building or anyone who needs a refresher in form building within uh, the latest form builder interface. On November 16th, we have a webinar on the APIs. What can I do with APIs? So if you're a developer or you're interested in learning more about our API, I definitely suggest uh, joining that webinar. And then at the end of November on the 29th, we have our Cooking with Zerion. Uh, this will be the second webinar or second year we've done this one, and it's been a great success where John goes through the Xerion team members and finds out some of the different solutions that they find really helpful when they're building out forms or building out different data flows, whatever it may be, any tips and tricks that they have, and then he shares it with the community. And before I hand it over to John, what we always like to do is we have a couple polls that we'd like to launch uh, just to get some insight of our, from our listeners. So the first one is, are you a current user? Those of you who've been a part of these webinars before i'm sure you're very very used to this poll so thank you for bearing with us and and answering the poll from the looks of it almost all of you have responded and that's great um, we have a small percentage of listeners who are xerion users a very large percentage of listeners who are iform builder only we also have some individuals who are not yet users but i um, supposedly are looking into the platform so one more question before john goes and this is kind of to gauge your interest level of some of the forms as well as uh, some of the offerings that we have if you're interested in more than one of these please respond and select more than one All right. If, as you respond, if I haven't mentioned it yet, we do record these sessions and all these recordings uh, do get uploaded in the next 48 hours. They'll be uploaded to a web page that you can access at uh, zerionsoftware.com, but they'll also be uploaded to Zerion Academy. If you don't have a username in Zerion Academy yet, we're going to go ahead and make you one after today's session so that you can access all the course materials. And I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and actually share the results with everybody because I think it's pretty interesting. And John, can you see the results? Yes, I can. All right. So you have your work cut out for you. <laughs> I certainly do. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sue, as Barrett said. Uh, I'm a solutions engineer here at Zarian Software, and I focus on uh, working with the uh, training and then also implementation of solutions. So the topic for today's webinar is going to be three forms every company should be using. Now, I know that sounds very general, but the intention here is that I wanted to uh, work towards expanding people's idea of what you can accomplish working with iForm Builder or working with Xerian Data Collector. Now, I know that we have a large amount of the audience who is not a current member, and so this is actually a really great first webinar for you all to join. I'm happy to have you here because what I'm gonna be able to do is show you some of the possibilities that are capable of using the tool, not only for a data collection project, for example, if you're doing some sort of a building inspection or you are doing a health surveying, you may wanna use the software for your actual work, but then there are other ways in which you can leverage the software, whether it be internally or in order to enhance your data collection experience that a lot of groups have not thought of before. So again, what I want to do here is I picked a sampling of three different forms uh, that I've seen. Some of them, one of them is actually one that we use internally at Xerian Software. Others I've seen from different groups. And I want to talk through how you're able to, again, uh, go beyond 
just your normal data collection into really trying to uh, change and refine your workflows and your work processes. Now I'm going to be doing three things with each one of these examples. The first thing I'm going to be doing is demoing the actual form for you. So I'll go ahead and share my, uh, my device's screen, walk through the form, show you how it works, and then I'll talk about its functionality, what it's supposed to be doing. After that, I then want to go into the form builder. And for those of you who are new, um, the interface may be a little bit overwhelming at first, but I'm going to talk through that. I'm also going to talk through it from the perspective of being a new form builder, and I can give you some background information on that as well. I would definitely encourage you to ask questions in the chat while I'm going through that so that we'll be able to clarify any confusion you may have. And then the third thing I want to do is, uh, using the context of each form, talk about ways you can then even further extend that form or that concept of data collection into your own workspace and how you can then take that and leverage it for your own needs. So we're going to start with this first form. Uh, on the previous slide, it said that it was an expense report. And so I want to preface this with the scenario where you're either out on travel or you have to go to the store to buy something for work and you either forget what you bought because it was a long day or you lost your receipt and you run into the situation of not being able to properly track your expenses and report it back. Uh, worst case scenario, you don't get reimbursed for whatever you bought. But the main thing is we want to make sure that it's not something you have to worry about at the end of your trip with a mountain of receipts. So what I have here is a form that's going to handle tracking your spending as well as any reimbursement payments you need to submit. The idea being that you want to monitor your per diem and then also have a backup of receipts for accounting so that they don't need to track you down later on when they're trying to do their job. So I'm going to jump over here to my device and I'm going to open up this form down here in the lower right called expense report. For those of you who have been inside a form builder for a while, you may have noticed that the icons are a little bit different. We are going to be releasing a new set of form icons in the near future, so that should give you a little bit of an updated look on your devices. Now, as I open up this form, you'll see at the top there are some basic report details. One of the first things I want to highlight is that this is auto-populating my name as well as my email address and the current date and time. If I try to select any of these fields, I'm unable to edit them because they are called read-only elements meaning that the data will be displayed and captured and preserved, but cannot be edited. So I have my basic information at the top. As I scroll through this form in the middle, you'll see there is a what's called a subform called receipts. That's where I'm going to be logging each receipt that I have that I want to include in my report. We're going to jump down a little bit below underneath. There is a section for signature, and then as well as a field where I would be able to list email addresses that I want to send this report to. Now let's go through the process of filling out this form. So as I press receipts, I want to add a new receipt to my expense report. I'm going to take a quick picture using my camera. And then I'm going to be able to list the price of the receipt. So I'll say the total is $5.55. I don't have any additional details. And you'll notice there's a quick note here that I wrote. This is a label element. And it says that the subform is in what's called batch mode. What this means is it's going to allow me to fill out the subform multiple times in succession very quickly. As soon as I press done, it's going to open up the form again right away, and I can fill out another record. I'm going to skip the picture for now, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to enter in a number that could not happen. So we'll say $7.89 and then 0.6 cents. So there's too many decimals here. If I try to submit this, You'll notice I'm going to get an error for an invalid total for the receipt. So I have what's called client validation built in, where it's going to check this number to make sure that it is appropriate, since this is a, uh, a currency value. I'm going to submit this. Once I'm done filling in my records, I'm going to go ahead and exit to go back. And you'll notice here, I have a quick summary of the receipts that I've captured, as well as the price for each one. And then down here now, this new element is shown that's called total expenses to submit. This is an aggregation or a sum of each of my subform records 
and I formatted it to a dollar amount as well. I'm able to review that real quickly, and then once I'm happy with the receipts I've logged, I'm able to add in my signature. I don't need to worry about emailing this to anybody else. I just want the form to be submitted for record. I can click on done and I'll go back and then I will pull down to sync my device. Now I have my device set up where the sync has to happen manually. So I have to manually sync it as I just did by pulling down on the screen. I could set up my device so that it will sync automatically as soon as that record is completed. So that could be a little bit faster. The downside is I wouldn't be able to review the record after I've marked it as complete. Now as that record uploads, uh, that's going to be the end of this workflow. And so what I want to do next is move over to the form builder and show you what this form looks like. So this is our form builder here. And actually I'm going to back up and view the parent form. And so when I say parent form, what I mean is the top level form. This is where I had my name, my email address, and then the total and the signature. We'll look at the subform next, which is the actual individual receipts that I was logging. Now inside of the form builder, I'm going to have a view here that's going to show me each of the different elements that I have on my form. You'll see the type is listed in this green box, so it's easy to see. And I have them separated by dividers to make it a little bit more readable with a label as well that's going to give me some additional information as a data collector. Now for those of us who are a little bit more experienced with form building and have worked with form building before, uh, you may have used some of the built-in functions, so if I scroll up here, such as my email, iformbuilder.email. I also have a custom function that I wrote called format date, and this is going to return a current date in this formatted string. But these are both examples of using smart controls, specifically what's called a dynamic value. The dynamic value is where you're able to set a default or calculated value for that element so that it does not need to be filled in manually. Now, if you've been up to date with the iForm Builder built-in functions, uh, you may have worked with those ones I just showed. But I also do want to highlight some new built-in functions that we've released recently. These are going to be for your environment details. You're able to set iFormBuilder.os version for the version of the operating system the app version, the app name, the forms version, the device model, and the device language. This one in particular can be extremely helpful when it comes to uh, debugging localization issues or understanding where your, your data is coming from if you have a form deployed to multiple countries. Now each one of these elements is set as a read-only, meaning I cannot edit it. In addition, the condition value is set to false, meaning that this element will be hidden from view. If we go back to my screen and I open up my expense report again, you'll see that there is nothing underneath this element that says email a copy of the report to the following addresses. If I go into my form builder though, you'll see that the element that has that label is all the way up here, meaning that all of these elements below are hidden from view. And that's because each one of them has this condition value of false. Now, as I jump into my subform, which is going to be the actual receipt itself, what we're going to see is that I have this subform here, and I have an example of what's called a required field. So this element is required, as you can tell by the red asterisk mark. On the right hand side of the properties, you'll notice that I have checked this as being required. What this means is that this element cannot, or this form cannot be submitted with this element being empty. So this is a required element. Additionally, as you saw, I demonstrated that the, uh, the total for the receipt had to be a proper number. And so I wrote what's called client validation to check here to make sure that there's not too many decimal places inside of my number. I also want to make sure the receipt total is greater than zero, so I'm not going to submit a receipt that has zero dollars on it. In the event either of these fail, I do have a quick message saying invalid total for the receipt. That allows the data collector to see the error message and it points them in the right direction and how to fix that form and where to make the adjustment.
Now jumping back here, uh, I wanted to real quickly point out that each of these forms is going to have a link in the slides that I'm going to distribute at the end of this webinar. Clicking on that link will give you the form package that you can then import into your own environment. That's going to be useful for current customers. For anyone who is not a current customer or who may be demoing out, uh, working with Zarian or iPhone Builder, uh, you'll be able to uh, hopefully import that as well. If you run into problems with that or if there's any more information you want about it, just let us know and we'll be able to connect you to the proper resources. Now this example of a form where we're taking something like an expense report, something that is not going to be towards our active data collection and using iPhone Builder for is really powerful because what this is highlighting is the ability to collect data and log data 24-7 effectively. You don't have to wait till you go back to the office or you go back to your hotel room when you have that receipt to log that information. Even if you're not going to sync the record right away, just by having it inside of Data Collector or inside of iPhone Builder and iForm, you now don't need to worry about that receipt as much. If you lose it, you took a picture of the receipt, and that's going to just make sure that your bases are covered. Internally, we've used this expense report um, for a long time. We also have other forms that fulfill similar roles that are going to smooth out the workflow of internal tasks. Another one that comes to mind is a request, a vacation request form that we have that is very simply just going to state the name, the time out, and the time back, and the reasoning for it. And again, that's just a real quick way to automatically track small things like that in order to notify the appropriate people. Now, Barrett, before I move on to the next form I want to demo, I wanted to quickly touch base with you to see if there have been any questions, any comments uh, that I could address, or if there's anything that you think would be useful to add. So I think you've covered a lot of the questions and comments that came about. Um, I do have a quick poll that I'd like to ask to see what people thought of this specific work uh, workflow. Sure. And if everyone could respond to that, that would be great. Additionally, I want to note, um, as John mentioned, he will be sharing this form with you via a form package that you can import into your iForm Builder or Data Collector account. And I think um, that's a great starting block for anyone who's looking to have a similar workflow so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I know there that every company is different and your form may be slightly different, but at least having a starting point will be very, very beneficial. Okay, so it looks like almost everyone has responded and um, definitely it looks like a large amount of people have responded saying that it's somewhat likely that they'll implement a form similar to this within their workflow. Okay. We have some people who are currently are already using one and others who don't necessarily see um, the, the use of this at this time. Okay, not a problem. And again, a lot of these, uh, these additional forms where we're going beyond your normal data collection are really going to be context specific. Some companies, this may not be something that they're going to be actively tracking in this fashion. So it may not be likely, but my overarching goal here is to provide some inspiration for other forms that may possibly be able to be made. And I do want to emphasize this because I found myself on uh, going on work trips and maybe I don't have a company credit card or I don't have it with me, whatever it may be. It's very, very nice to be able to just quickly snap that picture of the receipt, put in the amount and then not have to worry about it anymore. Yep. Absolutely. I know that I've lost receipts a couple times before and it's been <laughs> it's been a hassle trying to find them and, and track them down. All right. What I want to do next is move on to the second form that I have to show everybody. And this form is going to be focused on taking an active role in the process of refining data collection, specifically interacting with the forms that you're using as a field inspector. So the idea here is that as a field inspector, you may not normally be the person who's actually designing the forms. You have a designer or some sort of an administrator or manager who's made that form and they've assigned it to you and you have to use it. Now, assuming that you've been properly trained on the software and how to fill out the form, there are other small nuances to how the form was created that you may or may not understand. And it's very important we feel to leverage your field inspectors, to value their opinions, 
and to request feedback from them so that you're able to then as the form designer make revisions that are going to improve the quality of life for your field inspectors. The easier the form is for them to fill out, the better quality data you're going to get from them. And that's really, really important as we always strive towards improving the integrity of our data. So I'm gonna hop back over here to my device again. I'm gonna to go to this form in the lower left corner called MDC Feedback. MDC in this scenario is short for Mobile Data Collection. Now, this form is super simple. It's just a two element form and is going to have the purpose of uh, providing details for the feedback you have on a form. And then also, if you wanna give suggestions, you can do that here as well. I've also, in addition, added an image element where I can take a photo if that's applicable to the feedback. Now, when would you use this form? There's a couple of different ways you could use this. Uh, one, you could have this form shown on the home screen like it is here. And so for any of these forms that I have available, if I want to go in and say I want to give feedback on one of these forms, I could go ahead and go in here and say something like the expense report form is too slow to fill out. Right? And so now I'm able to relay that information to the form builder, let them know they could maybe touch base with me, ask why it's too slow, and then we could make improvements from there. Now the other scenario you may see is if you are a field inspector and say you're out, um, whether you're at a, a residential site or you may be at an ecological site in you know, a more remote area, there may be things that are inhibiting you from collecting all of your data. For example, if you're in a swampy area and it's very difficult to keep your device out while you're walking through, you may wanna make note of that, take a quick picture, let people know that they'll need to design the form in a way where you won't have the device in your hand the entire time. Similarly, if you're in a residential area or in a building, you may need to be climbing places or you may need to be in areas where you can't have your device out at that time, and so similarly, accommodations need to be made so that when you are filling out your form, you're not going to miss data or you're not going to have errors in your data collection. One other thing I would like to note is I intentionally made this MDC feedback form completely separate from everything else because the other way you're able to apply this form is you can attach this to one of your other forms so you get direct feedback on that record. So I wanna show you what that means. First, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back into my expense report and show you that at the bottom, uh, where it says email a copy of the report to the following addresses, that's the last element, just as a reminder. What we're going to do is we're gonna take our MDC feedback form and we're going to associate it to our expense report as a subform. So now I'm filling out a feedback on that one particular form and it's associated and linked to it and that's also going to be able to allow more targeted feedback. So as I jump back into my form builder, I'm going to go back to my list of forms, and I'm going to open up my parent form. Now the way I know this is the parent is I do have a naming convention, which is a best practice, of putting an underscore P at the end of the name, as opposed to an underscore C, which is going to be a child form. So as I open this up, what I want to do is towards the bottom, after email a copy of the report to the following addresses, and actually after this divider as well, after the horizontal line, I'm gonna highlight this, and then I'm going to add a subform afterwards. I'm gonna scroll down here on the left, click on subform, you'll see that element shows underneath my selection, and I'm going to apply a label. Now the label is going to be the text that's shown on the device. This name underneath is going to be also called the data column name, and this is going to be the heading inside of the database table for this data point. So what's important to note is this property has to be database friendly, meaning it has to be all lowercase, it cannot have spaces, and there are certain words that I cannot use as well. But for now what I'm going to do is call this feedback form. As I scroll down, I'm going to further configure my subform. By choosing the form that I want to associate 
at this point. And I want to show my MDC feedback form. My link mode here is set to single currently, which is what I want. That means I'm only allowed to fill out this subform one time per parent record. If I have this chosen to multiple, I would be able to fill out the feedback form multiple times within this one record. But for this scenario, it doesn't make sense to do that. I have all my configurations prepared. I'm going to save this form. I'm going to resync my device. And while that's downloading, Barrett, I want to check in to see if there are any questions I'd be able to answer. Sure. Uh, one that just came up is you said that it, it doesn't make sense to have that subform as multi-link. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of times people might have multiple uh, feedback points. So how would you go about handling that? Sure. Uh, what I would say to that is it's going to be a design decision for sure. Now, if I wanted to accept multiple feedback points per record, uh, I would have envisioned a feedback form that's a little bit more specific, maybe with some select elements to choose ratings for each of the individual aspects. Once I have that, then it makes sense to have multiple data points for my feedback. But as a very general form with just a text area, I think that they'll be able to put everything in one record. Does that make sense? I think so. And mm -hmm. as you mentioned before, it is, it's up to the person designing the form and their workflow. Absolutely. Um, one thing I do want to note is on some of the other forms that I've seen that customers have built for this kind of behavior, um, they've also had a field in there um, saying, like, if someone spotted a spelling error then the user could say exactly where that spelling error was and actually refer back to the question that that spelling error uh, was within the form. And I've also seen where they've had it set up so that if they had any other recommendations, so not so much any problems, but also recommendations, they actually had a whole other form for that. So it's really upon uh, based on a uh, design aspect, but I think those were some really cool ideas that people have done. That is really cool. I like those ideas too. Uh, and I do want to highlight that again, the entire purpose here is to really empower your field users. You want to leverage them as a resource, not just as a tool for collecting the data, but as a, a, you know, a valued part of the workflow in the process. Taking their opinion and using it to improve your forms is going to create a, a better work environment for everybody involved. Now, what I did was I added that MDC feedback form onto my expense report as a subform. I synced my device while we were talking, and what I want to do is go into this form now. I'm not going to go through the process of filling it all out, but I do want to note at the bottom, you'll see this form is available, and it says, please leave feedback on your use of this form. If we remember, that was my label text right here. So you won't see this feedback underscore form shown on the device. Now, if I enter into this element, then what it's going to do is it's going to bring up my subform for me to fill out. And then now this information that I type out here is going to be associated directly with the information I've typed in my parent form already. So I won't have to do things like say the expense report is too slow. I can just say, you know, element X was not able to be filled in correctly. And because the data is associated with one another, uh, as a analyst or as someone reviewing the data, I don't need to make that jump. I know already that it's explicitly pointing towards this one record. Now again, you are able to download this form package through this link below. Um, this is a form that I think will be a really good template for people to use because from here, you'll be able to expand outwards, you'll be able to craft it so that the feedback you're requesting is going to be pertinent to your own workflows. You're also going to be able to make the decision whether you want to have your form be filled out multiple times per parent record, if you want it to be standalone, if you want it to be a single fill out. All of these are valid options and it just depends on your goals and the value you're trying to achieve. Now Barrett, I know that we have a poll for this form as well. Uh, if you wouldn't mind launching that, I appreciate it, thank you. No problem. So um, one of the questions that came up was about spell check. Sure. Um, this individual was wondering if the form builder naturally had spell check in there, and I did respond 
um, saying that if your browser is configured to perform spell check, then then you should be all set. But um, if it's not, then that's really where the spelling errors can take place. Yeah. All right, it looks like almost everyone has voted. Uh, John, you can see the responses, right? Yes, I can. Okay, so I'll go ahead and close the poll and hand it back to you. Thank you. All right, so this last form I have for everybody, uh, I have this titled as See Something, Say Something. And this is a discussion that we've had internally at the company before many times. And it's this idea, again, of building off of the previous form where uh, you want to be able to empower your field users to give feedback on the data collection process. We're able to abstract that a level and go beyond just the data collection process and really have a cultural change where you're empowering each individual user who has a device to be able to have a voice and speak up. Uh, our VP of Sales, Ryan Coleman, has talked about this concept of Heinrich's Triangle to me before, and I wanted to relay this information to everybody on this broadcast. And the idea is that uh, for every uh, loss of life or major injury at a work site, it's really the, uh, the aggregation and the buildup of a larger set of uh, minor injuries, which is then built off of a even larger set of near misses or dangerous behaviors. The reason I bring this up is because if you have a mechanism for either reporting these dangerous behaviors or for speaking up in scenarios where you may be in a dangerous environment, then those small little pieces of data will add up over time to avoiding minor injuries, which will then add up to avoiding major injuries. And that's really a way of embracing this idea that safety at the workplace takes a village. It's not just the supervisor, it's not just the protocols, but it's the individuals who are actually out there on the site being able to communicate what they see and speak up when something is not correct. So if I go back over to my device, I can take a quick look at this form. You'll notice I have this newer icon that's going to have the red circle. I just chose that specifically for the color because it pops a little bit. As I open up this form, you'll see I have my full name, my email address, and my date, very similar to the expense report form in the beginning. Underneath, I'm going to have a couple of different elements. The first one is going to be a location element, so I'm able to track my GPS coordinates. This is, again, going to be very useful when you have on-site dangerous behaviors or dangerous scenarios. You'll see it tracks the latitude, longitude, and some other information. I'm able to take a photo. Let me take one more photo here as I am going through this webinar. You all will get to see a blurry picture of my kitchen. And then, lastly, I have a section for details. So I'm able to write something along the lines of, let's see here, let's say, the stove was left on, which, it, which it's not. But for the purposes of this, uh, this form, we'll go ahead and say so. I'll press done, I'll go ahead and sync my device, and then now that record has been submitted. So it's a very quick process to fill out this form, and then now I've spoken up as someone who's seen a dangerous behavior. Now going back into the form builder, let's go ahead and take a quick look at the see something, say something form. You'll notice some common elements, and now actually before I go through this, I'm going to move out of this device view into what's called our list or table view. I find this view is very useful for working with smart controls specifically my dynamic value and my condition value. And for those of us who are newer to form building or may not be familiar with this terminology, the dynamic value is going to control the actual elements value. So the number in a number field, the date in a date field, or the text in a character field. The condition value is going to control whether that element is shown or hidden. Now, I have here this iformbuilder.email, this is a built-in function used to collect the email address of the person who is logged into the device. This way I don't have to type that in. You'll see this same format date function, but I have a different date string this time. So this time it's going to show as month, day, year, and then hours as a 12-hour 
um, a 12 hour set minutes and then a.m. or p.m. Now what I want to do is go up here into the page level JavaScript. This is going to be an area where I'm able to write JavaScript code that I can use inside of my elements itself. I don't want to go through the individual specifics of each of these functions that I've written. The main thing I want to highlight is that the functions will be available for you when you download the form packages. And I have these functions in all three of the forms actually. So any one of the forms you import, you'll have access to these functions and then hopefully you can leverage them. Down here I'll have examples of using uh, default values to clear out an element. What I'm doing is I'm making sure the location is blank here when I open up a new form. Same thing with my text area. This is because sometimes what will happen is you may encounter what's called uh, form caching or data caching where your form is going to load a value from a previous record. This is because the software is optimized to create the fastest data collection experience possible and sometimes that means taking old values so that they don't have to be recomputed. So what I like to do and I've gotten in the best practice of doing this is kind of zeroing out any values that I have for elements. So even if I don't have a default value for the text area, I'm gonna set it to be empty so that I won't cache that value. Now at the very bottom of this form, I have this element called environment details. Now what I wanna note about this is that the text I have here is set up to give me all of those environment built-in functions I talked about during the first form, the expense form. But what's nice about this is it's been consolidated into a single element. What this means is it would be very easy for me to take the dynamic value, copy it, add a new element, I can call this environment details two, paste it in, and I have all that data again in front of me here. This is going to be really useful for adding in these environment details to forms pretty quickly, especially if you're taking a look at older forms and you want to add this data into those records. Now, in the event that you have newer forms and you're going to add that information in, one of the things that Barrett has recommended that I found very useful is for example, if I take this expense report and I have these fields below it in my environment details, my operating system version, app version, name, and so on, what I can do is I can use this form as a template. So what I'm going to do is I wanna preserve this copy of my form because I don't wanna mess, mess up what I have currently. I'm gonna create a copy of this form and inside this copy, let's go ahead and turn this into a template. So I'll be able to delete this element. I'm going to say don't check for the rest of my session because I want to delete these kind of quickly. And I'm going to remove all of these elements. Except my individual metadata fields. So these are already here. They're each already going to be hidden as well. And now I can, as a last step, rename this as new form template. For my description, I'm going to say, use this form template to include details such as operating system, form name, app name, and language, and device language. I can save this. And now that I have this template created, anytime I want to make a new form, all I'm going to do, instead of clicking create form, I'm going to find my form template. And I'm just going to do the exact same process I walked through earlier. Create a copy of the form. Then I can go into the properties and give this a new name. Let's say we'll call this uh, vacation request form. I can change this description. Save my changes. 
And then I can begin building my form from this point, having these elements already in my form. I don't have to add them ever again. So to recap, there's two ways to get these built-in functions into your form. The first way is going to be to use a single element with the dynamic value that I showed you in the other form. You can copy and paste that into a new forms element. It'll be faster because it's only going to be a single element that you have to add. For new forms that you make, we recommend that you have this template form. What's also nice about this is you can add things like color branding or names or other sorts of labels that are going to be consistent across all your forms and that's going to be less work for you in the long run as you duplicate this form as a starting point. Barrett, I wanted to check in to see if there are any questions that have come up while I was going through this form. Um, no, no questions. I think uh, just some comments that people thought it was really helpful and other people have done similar uh, forms just to kind of track the safety and I found it to be extremely valuable. Yeah, definitely. Um, the context of this form in particular was, uh, you know, see something, say something. So it's more of a group think. I know that in talking with, uh, with other colleagues and other groups, I've also seen forms for field inspectors who are going out to do inspections on an individual basis. So they are by themselves. And that in and of itself will present some safety concerns because if they run into a problem or if they're injured, it may be difficult for them to reach out for help. What ended up being built out in that scenario was a check-in form. So they would fill out the record and submit it before they began their job site and before they began their tasks. Part of that form was an estimated finish time. And what would happen is if they didn't check back in and submit another record you know, within a certain window, then that would alert the, uh, the site manager that you know, something may be amiss and that they need to follow up with that person. So again, it's just a nice way of adding in an element of communication, of being able to do that not when you're back at the office or back in your vehicle, but anytime you have your device on hand, you are able to communicate and you have a voice at that point. Barrett, did you have any other examples of, of groups that have used forms similar to this? It doesn't have to necessarily be for safety, but any way of extending, uh, you know, using mobile data collection beyond just the actual data that they've been trying to collect for their projects? Um, I mean, just w away from these three examples? Yeah, or even, even just as um, groups that have maybe used something similar to these. Okay, so I mean, if you if we're not talking through these three, one uh, form that I've seen come up a lot, and I, I mentioned this to you earlier, is the need for maintenance requests. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's one form that I see coming in. Like I would say, probably eight out of ten of eight out of the ten of our customers are using that. Okay. And it's amazing that everyone is using it, but they are they keep having to build it themselves. So I think. As you and I talked about before, maybe that's something that we can build out and then share in another webinar so other people um, can kind of get, not have to start um, from scratch. Oh, that would be awesome. That'd be really good. I think that would be useful for a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the other things is, like you said, for, for groups who, you know, we've seen this and we see it done over and over again. There are going to be common elements in those forms, and there are also going to be things that are specific that one group may not have thought of. Uh, one of the things I would definitely point people towards is our community forums. If you want to begin interacting with other groups and other people in the community, it's a nice way to post questions. Or if you're really proud of a solution that you've built out, you can post it there as well. Get feedback from our team as well as other organizations we work with. And that's another great way for us to collaborate and then build out better solutions as a whole. I agree. Um, and then just so you know, another comment from one of our listeners came in saying that they use one that details events and then sends an alert to an email distribution list for immediate action. Uh, I've seen that kind of scenario come up before, as well as people who will have it set up so that it'll send a text message or a voice message so that that immediate action is then uh, taken. Mm -hmm. And those are really great examples of, of taking your iForm data and then integrating it right with other uh, parts of your of your mobile hardware whether it be email or a text message 
And then again, getting that instant communication out there as fast as possible. I agree. And with that, John, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. Perfect. So if everyone can give their feedback on this sort of uh, form, and if it's something that they think they would use, or maybe they're already using one like this, I think that would be great. All right, it looks like almost everyone has responded. And it looks like a lot of people are um, somewhat likely to use it or very likely and a small amount already have one in place and some just don't find it applicable to their business. Sure. That's awesome. It's good so, to see that, uh, that this might be something that a lot of people want to implement. I agree. Um, so what I'll do, John, is I'll go ahead and close the poll and allow you to continue without interruption. All right. Thanks. All right. So. Uh, I, I want to do a quick recap at this point. I've gone through each of the three forms. I've talked about their use cases. I've shown what the form structure looks like inside of the form builder, and then as well as had discussions around extending these forms into other functionalities or other avenues. So at this point, what I want to do is just let everybody know that there are a lot of different ways that you can become more involved uh, working with us, working with other people in the community. The first one is going to be the Customer Success Center, and that's always going to be my go-to place to point people when they're looking for answers to their questions. Uh, we work very hard in getting a lot of documentation available for everybody so that you're able to walk through steps within that documentation. You're able to know what you have at your disposal in terms of tools so that you're able to build out the most meaningful forms as you can. We highlighted our Rosarian blog earlier in the broadcast because we recently had a blog post that was published the other day. I would highly recommend you go and take a look at those blog posts as we continue to put out more content uh, focused, not necessarily on our individual software, but just on topics that are timely for a lot of organizations who are dealing with data challenges. We want to become part of that conversation, that bigger conversation around how to provide value, and then also how to effectively problem solve with everyone. Along those same lines, our community forums are always going to be a great place to continue having discussions with the members of our community. So iForm Builder, Zarian customers, Zarian employees. It's a nice way to provide information and feedback for us. If you have feature requests that you'd like to make, that's also there's an area for that as well in the community forums. And I encourage people to take an active role in that. And then finally, from the perspective of training, uh, we will continue to offer webinars throughout the remainder of the year and into 2018. With certifications, we are actually done for the year, so we do not have any more certifications, whether that is Form Builder or Dataflow Automation for 2017. We will be starting those up again uh, in early 2018, though, so keep an eye out for that. The certifications are a really, really good way to uh, make sure that you have a well-rounded skill set that you understand some of the primary techniques and tools that you'll have enabled you know, in order to build out forms or to understand data flows so that you can become successful in building either one. Those certifications are also going to be changing over time as the platform evolves and as we get more feedback and more experience, these certifications are going to be a good way to stay up to date. It's a really good idea to have that refresher course to make sure that you are up to date with all the new things that we've been doing. As Barrett mentioned earlier, uh, after this webinar is completed, you're going to be getting a couple things from us. So the first thing is we will be posting a recording of this webinar. That recording will be able to be found on our homepage as well as on Zarin Academy. Along with that recording is going to be a copy of the presentation materials I've shown to you today, so as a PDF you will be able to download the form packages from them to import if you would like. And then finally, um, you will be receiving a feedback survey from us uh, where we would really appreciate some good feedback and how we can make these webinars more helpful and more meaningful. For those of you who are likely to implement some of these solutions, it would also be really great to hear your stories and how you plan on implementing these or in what ways you're planning on tweaking these forms to make them useful for your own businesses. Barrett, before we close this out, I wanted to ask to see if there are any other final questions that have come in over the last couple minutes. 
Um, just a reminder about how powerful our community forum is and if a lot of great ideas come through during these webinars. I try to push people to our community forum uh, for feature requests and I, I, I can't stress it enough how how important that is and if there's any idea that comes up and you really want to make sure that it's getting the attention that it deserves, I mean share it with your colleagues, share it with our team and we'll try to give it as many upvotes as we can. Yep, 100%. And that's all I have from my end. Okay, awesome. Well, Barrett, thank you so much for hosting this. Everybody who joined in, thank you so much for tuning in, participating, um, and continuing to stay active in our community. We really appreciate it. And I look forward to hearing and seeing from you all next webinar. Have a good rest of the day. Bye.